to see everybody. <clears throat> I hope everybody had uh, lovely holidays or time off or whatever they chose to do with their couple days around uh, Thanksgiving break. So, um, Mila, are you able to put the agenda up? Are you able to share it just so people can follow along if they don't have it? If you give me one minute, I can. That would be amazing. We are going while while Amelia is doing that. The first uh, order of business is just a formal roll call, and so um, what you would need to do is your 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 if your if this would be for uh, regular members of the um, RDAC. So you'll state your name and your role in the RDAC. So I'll start. So I am Michelle Spencer Manson, um, and I am currently the chair of the RDAC and a physician member. I'm Leslie Bennett. I'm a patient member and I'm the vice chair of the RDAC. Hi, everybody. I'm Craig Miller, um, director of immunology and respiratory disease research at Borger Ingelheim and a member of the RDAC. Hi, I'm Mary Caruso. I'm a family, a patient family member, a member of the um, council. I'm Emily Germain Lee. I'm a physician member of the council. Is there anybody else here um, from this part of the 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 RDAC appoint, appointees? Hi, this is Miriam Miller, uh, Commissioner Tutani's appointment from DPH. Any, anybody else who is not able to, that has not spoken out? Hi, this is Arnita Christie. I came on late. I'm with GSK. Hi, Arnita. It's good to Hello. see you. Good to see you, Leslie. Let's see. Start video. There we go. I just want to say hi to Leslie. It's Carolyn. Hi, Carolyn. How are you? Good. How are you? I invited a, a bunch of the members of the public, so uh, I'm trying to get everybody involved. Are there any other council members on board? We're one short of a quorum. Okay. Um, anybody else from the public who would like to introduce themselves? Sorry, sure. Hi. Are, are we going to continue without a quorum? Yeah, that was my first question as well. We can, move on. we can continue the meeting without a quorum. We just can't take a vote on the minutes, correct? Okay. All right. So just uh, is um, the purpose of today's meeting, just to kind of stay on our agenda here, was is to discuss the setup of the RDAC governance and planning for the next year, what our plans of action will be. Um, unless we get, get a couple more people to join, I would agree with, with Leslie that we're gonna not be able to approve the previous minutes. Some last, just a quick summary of the last meeting. The last meeting was really an introductory meeting to start looking at what our initial priorities were gonna be, which was looking at doing some strategic planning and looking at setting up our governance and, talking about rare disease day. So those things will be re-brought up today. Um, and we will go, um, we'll go, we'll go from there. Uh, number three is public comment period. So uh, as you know, people want to introduce themselves, is there anything that you would like to say, bring up now is your time to do that. Hi, I'm Rachel. I'm a friend of Leslie's and I'm a member of the Connecticut Rare Action Network. And I lobbied this past year at Connecticut's Rare Disease Day. Hi, Rachel. Yeah, welcome, Hi. Rachel. Hi, everyone. My name's Kelly Constantine. Um, I serve on the board of RSDSA, the Reflex Sympathetic Dystrophy Syndrome Association. Um, I have CRPS, POTS, Ehlers-Danlos, um, and I know Leslie, so nice to see you. Hi, Kelly. Okay. I'm Veronica. Brian Rosen. I'm a non-member, just interested party with uh, Alexia on AstraZeneca rare disease. Hi, Brian. 
Hi. I'm Rep uh, Representative Mitch Polinski, and I am uh, um, also not a member, but I am a, a very, very interested um, uh, observer and a longtime um, supporter uh, of uh, the cause and uh, Rare Disease Day and, and all of the uh, earth changing um, gyrations that have been gone through and that has gotten us to uh, this point. So thank you everybody very, very much from uh, my perch in the uh, General Assembly. Thank you for attending. And thank it you means for a great deal to support. Me. Yeah, thank you. Hello, I'll say hi. Um, hi, I'm Gwen Peterson. I was diagnosed with ALS in 2018. I was 32 years old. Um, I fall squarely into the 90% uh, sporadic cohort, which means uh, we don't know uh, a heck of a lot of around why people like me get ALS, which is uh, which is why I do a lot of work um, at a federal level, um, lobbying for more money for early kind of translational um, uh, research, better science. I've been in uh, a ton of uh, trials, uh, experimental, mainly observational. Um, yeah, so I've I've done a lot. Um, hopefully, I'll be I'll be of some use uh, here. And it's nice to meet everyone. Thank you for joining us, Gwen. Um, I just wanted to say too. I was also diagnosed uh, almost six years ago with spina bifida occulta and tethered cord syndrome. I had my detethering surgery just about six years ago. Um, since then, I've undergone spinal stenosis surgery and was just recently diagnosed last week with something called uh, Morbihan's disease, which is the ugly cousin of rosacea um, and just starting treatment. And I also just completed my MSW uh, with Leslie's help. So thank you very much, Leslie. Okay. Uh, Glad to hear it. Finally, I focused my uh, final MSW project on lobbying for the proposal that Governor Lamont had put forward during the last legislative session uh, to allow for uh, medical debt forgiveness for families. Wonderful. Thank you. And congratulations on your MSW. That's a great, that's a great accomplishment. Thank you. I don't know if I did this right. Hi, I'm Veronica Hernandez. Right. Am I on? This is new to me. This is the first time I came to one of these meeting meetings. I'm a parent to a 10 year old with neuropathic Gaucher's disease diagnosed in 2014. And I was interested in attending this meeting um, to be more active with um, helping the rare disease community. And my daughter is finally at the most stable she's ever been in life and I could participate more. But our biggest struggle is we don't have enough home care nursing for me even to go back to work now that I have the Katie Beckett waiver and even for her to attend um, in-person school. So that's my biggest struggle um, with dealing with a rare disease on a daily basis. It's a full-time job and I'm a single parent. So thank you for having this. And I'm interested to learn more and how I can maybe help our community and help others. Well, thank you for coming and thank <laughs> you for your story. That's great. And I'm just checking in. I'm I'm Candace Blue Hardy. I'm a mom to two kids with PKU and I'm outside working some uh, I will turn off my video to not be distracted with leaves flying around me and snow flurries and whatnot. <laughs> anyway, but here to help in any way I can, with Rudy, as you come to the website, just let me know. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else, anybody else from the public want to share any thoughts or comments? I'll just introduce myself. Nick Carlutzis and a uh, parent to Lucia with um, cardiofaciocutaneous syndrome, CFC syndrome, and um, longtime friend of Leslie and grateful. And the past um, 
attendee and MC at Rare Disease Day. Hi, Father Nick. It's great to hear from Grateful you. For your, thank you. Appreciate you all. Thank you for coming. Congrats on the RDAC. Thank you. So, so now I'm feeling like I should introduce myself. Everybody did such an amazing job. Hi, I'm Carolyn Masisa, and I see my colleague Emily Germain Lee is on the call, and um, I am um, also a research scientist. I do rare um, metabolic bone disorder research. I do both basic clinical and translational research. There's a lot of patient education and advocacy, and I form. I also serve in scientific advisory boards. And um, I host the annual Rare Disease Day event at the Frank H. Netter MD School of Medicine in Hamden, um, part of Quinnipiac. And um, Leslie has been able to attend a couple of those events. But um, just part of my my um, portfolio really is in patient advocacy and education. So I'm really thrilled to be here. And I thank Leslie for um, extending the invitation. Thank you. I'm glad you could attend. Um, Michelle, I think uh, Dorian just called in. So we now have a quorum. Wonderful. Dorian, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, yes. I'm so, Apologies for being late. I was held up in another meeting. No I'm Dorian Long, and I am a manager at the Department of Social Services in our Social Work Services Division, and I'm uh, here to represent DSS. Great. Great. Glad you're here. Up, oh, and we just, Colleen Brunetti just called in. Great. Colleen, do you want to introduce yourself and what your role is on the R R R D A C? Sure. Um, my name is Colleen Brunetti. I am an adult patient. Um, and also, sorry for being late. I over rely on my calendar auto populating and holding the space, and it definitely did not. So I will look into that. But, um, apologies for that. We're glad you're here, though. <laughs> uh, Michelle Leslie, did you want me to continue sharing my screen? Yeah, uh, if there's another, that'd be great. Okay. Okay. Is there any um anybody else? That, Leslie, have you seen anybody else who's who's joined from the committee? Or do we have everybody now? We've got. I think that's it so far. We've got two, three, four, five, six, seven. I think there's eight of us. Okay. Sorry. Can we? Uh, we form. We we can go back then. I think and then improve the previous minutes. Now we have enough people. Is there a bad chance to review the, the, the previous minutes that were sent out? I I'll give a first. Okay. And I'll second. Okay. All right. Is anybody uh anybody is anybody opposed to approving the meeting, the minutes? I mean addendums. Everybody in favor? Yep. Yes. Yes. Okay. Good. All right. So they're approved. And then Somehow or another way, we went back, went back up. Mary, there we go. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So then we're um, we're gonna go um update. We're gonna just um a couple of things here. We're on we're down to number four on our agenda. Um, update, clear up issues in previous meetings. So um two things. I'll I'll take care of I'm gonna kind of work with A and then Leslie will will work with B and then kind of um go into number part five, which is really the the meat of this meeting. So um, I wanted to just discuss briefly the meeting format and get a sense of whether people think they're going to be able to come in person or if if they people really want this to be all virtual, because I think um, looking at kind of getting feedback for people who are wanted to attend in person has been light. So I want to get in, this input from the meeting people, if people think that they are going to be able to come in person, at least to some, if there's barriers to that, or people just feel like the only way they're going to be able to do this is virtually. Michelle, can I weigh in? Yes, please um, do. It, it's important that we do have a presence and that we do meet in person. Um, I would encourage all members to at least attend two meetings in person per year. Um, it's really important that the public can see us and that can come up and talk to us. Um, that's a, it has a huge impact and it means a lot to um, our population. The more we do in person, the more involved we seem to get. Um, Zoom is great. It allows all of us to attend, especially in our population when there's a possibility of people getting ill, but it's coming together and talking. We learn so much more from each other in person to person. So that's my two cents. I would love to have the blended hybrid meeting, you know, all the time. 
but I would encourage members of our, our committee to at least attend two of our meetings in person. Yeah, My two cents. Yeah, it's Craig here. I, I fully agree. And sorry, I've been remiss in terms of trying to um, identify some times to, to host the, the, the council um, here at uh, Borger Ingelheim. But I, I totally agree with you. I think that nothing beats the face-to-face. -face. Maybe we, we've been trying to take an approach where, you know, we're kind of just ad hoc. Let's see where we can kind of get. Do, do you think there would be a, do you think we should be more deliberate about it? And then by looking at our calendars, try to identify, you know, um, times where we're perhaps we can make ourselves all available. Be a bit more deliberate. Like let's target our meeting in February, for example, that that we should, if that is the sort of consensus time where we all try to then um, meet up is that a strategy that maybe we want to take as opposed to each week we try to find, um, you know, the opportunities? Do you know what I, I mean? Think we have yeah, a I think set day. We do have a set day. I mean, we're, we're meeting the th the third, the fourth Tuesday from two to three. Yeah. You know, uh, sorry, Michelle. What I mean is that we say that Tuesday in February, we all aspire or as many of us can aspire to be at that, at a face-to-face -face. Um, okay. and based on our calendar availability, we really target that as opposed to opportunistic every week for it. You know every, every month, you mean? Yeah, yeah sorry, sorry, every month. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's fine. If you guys want to pick, like, we're going to do, you know, um, we could do something like two two Zoom, one in person, two Zoom, one in person. Yeah. I would yeah. want to do something like that. Yeah, would that sort of work if we kind of moved our, and then if we did it far enough ahead, then we could give enough calendar, ideally, like, up, um, work to, to, to ensure that we could, um, as many of us as possible could then make the on-site. Okay, that sounds that sounds good. So we I did, just, go ahead. I had one question. I think that's a terrific idea, but um, I, I'm a division head and have a lot of things booked through the day. I'd love to, you know, be there, but I don't want tomatoes thrown at me. Sorry for bringing this up, but is there any possible Saturday, for example, um, that we could all get together. But I know that's a real strain on people. And I'm only saying that because maybe everybody would be free if we're going to designate a certain time. It's oh. just, I know for the next many months, like there isn't a slot yeah. for me to be able to get away to get somewhere. Um, yeah. Emily, we have some state employees, myself included, who are serving in, in their capacity as state employees. And so we can't, we can't work on Saturdays. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. You yeah, I, I'm sorry. It, it, would there be a compromise though, where we could still meet potentially like later in the day? If it, it maybe the the virtual we can we, we keep at this sort of time, and then a, a face to face is kind of later in the workday. Does that offer an increased opportunity for the face to face piece? Or would that help you, Emily, at all? Or I think we're gonna, the state employees are going to be the same thing. They're they are probably on. I'm going to guess a nine to five or whatever the hours uh, are. Yeah, that, are. that would be for non unionized for unionized staff. For non unionized staff, mm -hmm. we can show up anytime that we need to show up. So, mm -hmm. um, it all depends on your job classification. I certainly have worked on Saturdays or holidays. So, so or, you, um, know. you know, but for unionized staff, that would be problematic. That would require yeah, overtime. Okay. And, you know, it, it gets complicated with, you know, depending on your job class. Um, I, I just wanted to throw out there that in February, I will be away on vacation. So, you know, <laughs> although I will be willing to do that, I am away on vacation from the 19th of, uh, of February through the 8th of March. So, um, if, if we schedule the in-person meeting, I won't be there. I just want to let you know that. Well, I'll take my suggestion back then. I, you know, I don't want to impact anyone's schedule. Mm -hmm. and I'll just try to make it. Mm -hmm. If if we have a far enough, you know, far yeah. enough date, uh, I'll just try to make it. Can I, we I, meet at your work site? It's, you know, um, uh, at UConn, I tried getting a room. If we have a lot of, um, a lot of warning, I could get a room, I think. And I also, um, you know, although I'm employed by UConn, I'm very tightly connected in division headed Connecticut Children's because, you know, the PEDS is all one mm -hmm. thing. And mm -hmm. Carolyn could work with me. In fact, she's on. Maybe we could get a room at Connecticut Children's. Um, Would that make it easier for you to attend in person, I think, is my, my point. Not necessarily, though. You know, it depends on my schedule that day. Mm -hmm. um, you'd think it, it would make it easier in the sense it's only that gap 
but you know, it's a, depending on whether that gap's free. But I could certainly, I don't know for February, but I could, it will sounds like someone else has February, but I could certainly plan ahead, reschedule anything needed if it's a far enough date. I really didn't want to impact on anyone. I just brought up Saturday as a as a whim. It's a, it's a good suggestion. So maybe an action for this would be that we could just kind of what we did at the beginning in terms of setting this date that we have a sort of a poll that would indicate our preferred sort of availability for the face-to-face -face kind of map throughout the year. And Emily, I'm the same way, like the, the longer term I, the, the longer lens I have into it, the easier it is for me to uh, maneuver the calendar to make it effective. So that might be something that we could take up and then find the sort of ideal dates and then really commit to those as being the face-to-face -face ones and try to um, do everything we can to, to mm -hmm. have that engagement. So can I can I just play in for a second here, just because I have yeah. a conundrum with the patient organizations I work with. So um, Emily, you, you're um, serving as a scientific or medical advisor. Is that your role in this in the RDAC? A uh, physician scientist. Yeah. All right. So the what we've done is, um, like for example, the XLH network is 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 the you know executive team, the team from these members meet. And then, um, and they have their meeting because their schedules are far more flexible than ours, and then, um, or or less rest or or more restricted than ours. And then, um, there's just a feed forward mechanism for information that gets disseminated to the scientific advisors. And then, you know, so then the frequency of the meetings can can happen at the regular frequency, and and you know, every now and then we make sure that they're present in the room. But in between meetings, when that can't happen that you just create a space so that that information gets effectively and efficiently transferred to the to um to your um SAB just as a suggestion. I I just want to jump in um as the DPH representative DPH is hosting this meeting I just need to feel the need to remind folks that we're outside of public comment period um so because of that we need I to apologize. Focus, we need to focus the discussion within members who are appointed to the council. Um, uh, so we just need to make sure that we keep that in mind. Thank you. So can I can I make a suggestion here just because I really want to spend, a, uh, we have a couple of big, more important, like yeah. not, not important, but but things that we do. Can we, can we try for the March 26th meeting to make it our first in-person meeting? Because there's two reasons for that. One is March 27th is very close to rare disease day. Yeah. And at least two of us, myself included, will not be here on that meeting. Um, and that will also get us past the worst of the virus season. It will also get us past the worst of the threat of snow and ice and sleet of, of kind of derailing us. And then try to get as many people as possible there on March 26th. And then try to find a schedule at that point when everybody's in person with their, you know, phones out to have like let's these are the following times we're going to meet in person would, would that be acceptable to everybody at this point yes yes yep my calendar looks pretty good okay and what, so what, what's, what's the mar what's the march location just so i can write it down did we decide on that already we have not we okay. do not have a march lo location at this point um the only i i know Jax is capable of hosting it because they have talked to me and then Yale is certainly capable of hosting it as well. So I am fine either way. We should just, we'll get one of those two. I will, we will try to sort that out um, in the next week or two. So everybody has that so they can put it on their calendar officially. Cause that, I know travel time will factor into what yep. people can do. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Perfect from show. Okay. Wonderful. Anything else, any other comments on the discussion, the meeting format, or, or do we feel like we have that resolved at least for the short term? Sounds good. Okay. Rare disease day planning. I'm going to, Leslie, I know has been working on this and talking to a lot of people. So I'm going to turn that over to her. Um, rare disease day planning. I was talking to members of the legislature. We can do um, a breakfast sort of thing or a press conference at the, um, at the state house on that day. And as many members of the RDAC who could be there as possible, that would be great. We can just talk about what we're doing and uh the Nord um, Connecticut Rare Action Network would like to join in with us. They'd like to read the governor's proclamation. Is the 28th or 29th better for anyone? Shall I just go ahead and pick it? I'm good with either one, Leslie. Okay. 
I think the 29th would be nice if it's I'm not I'm not gonna be there, but but Dr. Well, well, Dr. Chang is gonna go in my in my stead. So okay, that's uh, great. I talked to him about it at our meeting. Um, just because it's kind of the like the rarest of the rare. <laughs> it's so true, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I would prefer that. I'm gonna yeah. I'm I am gonna wear I I I got I bought little striped stuff for all of us to wear on vacation together on the 29th. So I'll send a picture. <laughs> That would be great. Um, yeah, I love it. We'll, love we'll, it. Be, we'll all be at Disney World. I even got I even got one for the dog. We'll bring the dog to Disney with us. So we'll go all out there and take a picture. Yeah. Um, but uh, what do you call it? I think that would be, I think that would be a really nice thing to do if there's no strong feelings one way or the other. Because that really is the rarest of the rare. And I think it would be yeah. impactful. Yeah, I think so too. Love it. But I just wanted to make sure everybody was okay with that. Yeah. I have I have not heard back from the chairs of the uh, public health committee yet, but that doesn't mean anything. They're crazy time of year right now. So, yeah, um, totally. yeah. yeah. so it, it, we'll get one or the other. So, it, it, I mean, we'll get, I'll shoot for the 29th. That's what I'm pushing for. So that's basically it. And then NORD will, um, the Connecticut Rare Action Network will join in with us. And uh, they, like I said, they want to read the governor's proclamation at our meeting, if that's okay with everybody. Any objections? I think that's a great idea. Okay, moving on. This is where we get into our governance. And um, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at the rough draft that I prepared of our, our potential bylaws. Um, I talked to a number of advocates from other rare disease advisory councils and, and advocates here in the state. It was recommended that um, I use the law that created us and then, um, use for our foundation and then use the bylaws of at least two state committees. And I know people on both the Consumer Advisory Council under the Office of Health Strategy and on the Pharmacy and Therapeutics Board at under the uh, Department of uh, Social Services. Both of these have been around for a while. They're great advisory committees. And um, I took portions from both of those to create the foundation for our bylaws. The only other thing that was recommended is since under the law, we will be soliciting funds for um, our operation and the um, construction of a, uh, a website. Uh, it was recommended that we have a, a treasurer and basically a secretary because we're gonna, our website is gonna be um, very specific for rare diseases. So we need somebody who has a lot of knowledge about rare diseases and we shouldn't you know, place the burden of all of that. The secretary will not be totally responsible for the minutes. They will review the minutes with um, Millie, Millie. Um, But those are two things. So that's a proposal. It was also proposed that um, we have an executive committee that will basically set the agenda for each of our meetings and set the strategic plan for the year. Now, the executive committee, it was recommended that it could be basically the chairs and uh, the treasurer, secretary, and representative from the state. That would be a five-person executive committee. If people wanted to expand it more, we could add two more members of the council, but that's up to all of us. And these are things that we need to discuss and, and figure out. Anybody's looked at the bylaws? Any comments? I saw your draft a while ago. If and I can't remember the date, but it looked quite good. I thought it's pretty complex. I mean, I just basically cut and paste a lot of the information from the others. So um, we can look at it. We can refine it. There's a lot of uh, uh, grammatical errors and, and uh, language difficulties, but we can go through and clean that up. This is just a rough foundation for us. So over the next between now and our January meeting. If you can take a look at it, just in dribs and drabs, um, see what you think. The first part the uh, is basically coming from the law. Yeah. We can refine the language, make it more modern, but it's basically from the law. So those are functions that we are basically by law supposed to do. Mm -hmm. um, and part of our setup, we can change certain things. We can go, now that we have a chair and vice chair in, apparently in January, 2024, we can go to co-chairs. Those are things that we can do. Um, take a look at it, give me your thoughts on it and let me know what you think about the executive committee. Are any of you interested in being the treasurer or the secretary? Um, 
let me hear. I, I would love to hear your comments right now, if you can. Mary? I don't really, are you as calling my name because you want me to do yes, one? Yes, I want you to. <laughs> I'm kind of secretaried out, but I guess I could do that if you needed me. Okay. Colleen, do you think of anything? Um, I need to look them over in more detail. Um, kind of the same right now. I'm a little bit tapped out on time, but would also consider secretary. You don't want me anywhere near treasurer stuff. Okay. Um, Craig. Yeah, I'd certainly be interested in, in in helping. I think I just got to look at what the uh, what either okay. of the, the rules would sort of be involved with, but um, it they, they seem both achievable and not uh, um, and, and maybe just a bit more on top. But, but let me take a look. Okay. Emily. Um I certainly would be happy to review minutes that are done when you said, you know, um, Nelia would be um, typing the minutes because I'd be doing that anyway and it would make me do it very carefully. But the secretary is also going to be in charge of basically making sure all the information on our website is correct. Um, we're going to be putting up information for physicians and for the public, and we're hoping to get reliable information up there on uh, diseases where clinics are, um, you know, resources. You know what? I'm going to modify my statement then. I might not be the best person for secretary just because I, I don't think I have a broad enough experience yet with rare diseases as a whole. I'm I've uh, been very focused on one for a long time, um, but I am a pretty prolific writer and proofreader and be very happy to run back up um, and help with anything that, that is going out to the public. One thing to say is that I don't think the secretary has to be solely responsible for, for the content of the rare disease. So we have no. multiple experts here. So the, 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 the secretary would more or less be coordinating and making sure the appropriate people with the appropriate level of expertise we're writing. The other thing is we're writing this for lay people. This is not being written for like other healthcare providers. So we want to make, I think actually having um, both the healthcare professional with the expertise, as well as um, some of our patient um, advocates, like kind of um, like kind of buddying up for lack of a better way of doing it would make sense. Cause like when I start going off about, you know, mitotic segregation you're gonna be like dude no don't do that. nobody wants to hear that, right? <laughs> <laughs> that detail, no. <laughs> um, so you know that i mean i don't i think the, the secretary would not be responsible for that on their own the secretary would just be responsible for helping coordinating it and making sure people were doing it and um we, we i also think we don't need it to be restricted just to the rdac voting members to work on that content of the website we could no. get we can do that where we can get subcommittees and bring in other experts from our we have like th four uh what do you call outstanding academic institutions here for that work on rare disease work we could um we could get input from all these people to help with that so it's really we're coordinating and then then proofreading and editing. So we, we really need someone who's got strong proofreading and editing skills, not necessarily individual skills in rare disease. Okay. I was wondering if as a member of the public, I, I could participate. Um, I have my undergrad in biology and chemistry and my master's in chemistry. So I could, and I do it for my parents all the time. I read the scientific articles and put it in layman's terms. So I don't know if I can assist or partner with someone that's actually on the committee. We will probably ask for your assistance, yes. Okay, great. <laughs> we'll be reaching out to members of the public for assistance. Great. Um, so it, go ahead. Sorry, I don't wanna to get too far off track, but I think I have about a half a dozen questions about the logistics of the website. Um, just. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's something that we could like, because yeah, that I, I have a lot of questions turning over in my mind as well. Maybe there's an opportunity for us to, can we take this up at the next meeting and then solidify yes. the, the yeah, we can. And, okay. and give us some time to kind of like ground ourselves into the, the expectations and, and what that looks like and then make sure that we can be effective. Yeah, that sounds great. 
This is more just a thought session right now, because yeah. the other thing that we're going to have to consider are subcommittees. Right. And yeah. we'll be pulling in members of the public to help us with that. Um, okay. yeah. It was also recommended that we have three subcommittees, one dealing with operations. That would be, you know, getting finding out ways for funding to help the treasurer and also dealing with the um, uh, the website. The other one would be education and research. And uh, the third recommendation was a committee on legislation, potential legislation that we would be seeking. I don't know if those appeal to you or if you have ideas for other different subcommittees. Well, Anybody? Those seem, yeah, those seem like three pretty, I like the idea of an operations subcommittee and this can help I think to even, if, if that was like co-led, for example, by the treasurer and the secretary, for example, and then working together to try to get that ops cadence and get that all kind of pulled together, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Uh, I was trying to think about education and research put together, but that, you know, I, I, I think makes sense. And then certainly legislative. Um, yeah, because I guess the point of four is kind of too, maybe too much, right? Too, Probably too much to begin with, yeah. but we could, we could rotate these. We could figure out what works yeah. best for us. Yeah. Um, the the legislation one we thought would address both um, issues for patients and for the uh, healthcare community. Yep. Yep. Um, it would, I was just trying to figure out ways to pull in everybody and um, in in talking it over with others. This was a recommendation from a couple of the other states. So yep. um, whatever you think, but. I think the most important thing for us right now is to uh, try and get an executive committee, you know, going. Uh, and we should figure out whether we want all of the officers, which I think is probably the best way to do it. And then the state member, which would give us five. Yeah. Um, I think if we add two more from the, um, the council, more than half of the members would be part of the executive team. And yeah. I don't want people to feel left out making decisions and all of this. So let me know what you think. Okay. Um, yeah, so go ahead, Craig. Yeah, I was just gonna, I'm, I'm still wrestling with in my mind because I think it has a lot of value that's a smaller group that can be, uh, it's a bit more agile and, and um, but, uh, what, what I'm, but then at the same time, we're, re we're a relatively small committee and can we still be effective as a, in this entirety or, so I'm just trying to weigh it back and forth in my mind, uh, the pros and cons. Do you think as part of the executive committee, the way you described it, Leslie, was the chair, co-chair, treasurer, secretary, plus the- um, the um, oh, Miriam, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then if, as we, if, if we divide into sort of then the subcommittees, would we just ensure that we had an officer then embedded in each of those subcommittees to also then bring back to the executive um, group then the- um it doesn't necessarily have to be an officer, but we need at least one member of the RDAC on each one of these. Of the yeah, definitely. On, on the committees, ideally, it would be ideal to have two members of the RDAC on each of the committees. Yeah, yeah. okay. And then they can report back to report the, back. The, entire, yeah, the entire council. Okay. Um, the executive committee can meet. Every time we all meet, it's a public meeting. Yeah. If we have an executive team, the executive team could meet like the week before our meeting, make sure we get out the agenda and any materials that are going to be needed for discussion in our meetings. Yeah. And then um, they can meet in private. Doesn't have to be open to the public at that point. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it's just there are little issues that can be discussed at that point without, you know. Yeah. Understood. Understood. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That, that makes a lot of sense. Then I, you know, I think I favored that having that model. Okay. Yeah, I think it makes sense. But I want you all to think about if you'd like to be one of the officers and it would be a good idea. Even if you're, you know, treasurer, there's a lot of us who can help you and will be willing to help you. We can't right now even talk about um, soliciting funds until we get this all in place. Um, I know Jim goes on about, you know, we need governance, this, that, and the other thing. And, and he's right, but until we get our bylaws or our governance yeah. in place, we're kind of, uh, not a lot of things we can discuss about who we can approach for funding, um, you know, and how we go about doing it. One of the things that I did write into the bylaws and it's taken from, I think it was the the P and T committee, but I'm not sure is if we solicit funds, they need to be, um, anybody who's raising funds for us needs to be a 501c3. So I want you to go through and look at that information. 
um, it was recommended that uh, that be placed in since it's one of the things that some of the state committees can, uh, or the, the state uh, departments approve. Miriam, uh, Dorian, is there anything that, have you looked over the bylaws? Do they look okay to you? Uh, at first glance, but I, I didn't read them in great detail. So I just want to, you know, I, I reviewed them. Okay. But I didn't see anything that stood out for me. Okay. I need to take another look at them. I was off last week. Okay. I, I appreciate that. I, I'll get in touch with you all. I will also have them run by um, uh, members of the CGA, probably uh, try and get somebody to run them past the uh, LCO to make sure we're in compliance with everything. But um, like I said, that most of them came, most of the um, bylaws, a good foundation portion of it came from the PNT board and uh, OHS's um, consumer advisory council. So they should be okay. Um, anything else that anybody wants to add, um, please let me know. Well, one thing you said about the education and research, you know, having someone doing those, I think that's a great idea. Maybe keep them separate. Um, but like just my, I'm vice president of the Human Growth Foundation, which deals with a lot of research, education, advocacy for rare disorders too, and growth disorders and um, sort of a person for each reports at the board meeting um, yeah. to give the update. And I think there's a, gonna be enough in each field. Um, like I, I'm in the scientific advisory board with OIF, the OI Foundation, you know that foundation well, Leslie, and they're, they're very broken down. It seems to work well having someone focused on one thing instead of both education and research, you know, because the more involved we get, the more we're going to have definitive areas mm -hmm. within each. And then the, the philanthropy will go towards one or the other area, perhaps, too. Yeah, and it's just, we're just trying to get ourselves down to just like three basic committees to start, we can expand or, you know, like the education, they can do education one time, research the next, that sort of thing. And then, yeah, yeah, and, and that's just basically it, but it's just trying to get um, the number of subcommittees we have just limit it to a, a smaller number so we don't get over, overwhelmed to begin with, especially during our first year. This is basically our setup time, and I'm sure a lot of things that will happen, like the operations committee can do, um, you know, fundraising. They can do the format for the um, the uh, website. They can also, they're also, like, I think it's written into our bylaws, they need to be updated every couple of years as we change, as we grow. Yep. So those are all things that they're going to be responsible for. So yep. just things to think about, um, things to look at, and... Let me know what you think. I'll be contacting all of you over the next, um, well, before our next meeting in February, uh, or in January, I'm sorry. Um, so over the next, in December and, and January, I'll be contacting you about what you think, mm -hmm. what you'd like to see changed, what, how you'd like to be involved, because all of us are going to be, have to work on this. We're all going to have to be actively involved in if this committee is going to really make a difference. We're going to have to start looking at legislation. I'm already talking, as I, I think I mentioned at one of the earlier meetings, I'm already talking to the chairs of the Public Health Committee about adding rapid whole genome sequencing for um, critically ill children who lack a diagnosis, uh, getting a bill passed for that. It's being used now in, I think, 10 other states, and it's helping to lower health care costs and improve the quality of care for these children. So it, it's something. it's a personal um, issue for me because my daughter Kelly was among the undiagnosed. Everybody knew she had an inborn error of metabolism, precisely what it was. They they never knew, even when she died. They still hadn't had an idea. They knew she could not break down protein. That was about it. But it's important to families, even to the state, the, the cost savings to the state and getting these children diagnosed early is just astronomical. So mm -hmm. that's one thing that um, I'm already starting on, not on behalf of the RDAC, but <laughs> as a patient advocate in the state. But these are things we need to start thinking yep. about. Yep. And all of us need to start thinking about that because um, the next session starts in um, soon. And so we need to get ideas in front of members of the, um, especially the public health committee um, within the next few weeks. So if you have any ideas for legislation, please let me know. I'm the one 
I'm basically the legislative contact, I think. Um, and so is Colleen and, and Mary. We've all worked on it. But um, we need to start working on these things. Yep. I will mention just because you brought up the rapid hole genome for critically ill children, Leslie, we're doing that. We've been doing that at, at I know. for like almost two years. And so we do have a way to help support that in Connecticut, if that's helpful. Yeah. And, and I was aware of the fact that you were doing it, but it's just CMS is now paying for it. So we might as well get the, the kids, all the kids under, uh, you know, Medicaid on it and, and doing all this stuff. It's, it's not a huge number of children. Yeah. 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 And, and that's the whole thing. It's really not, but the cost savings, I mean, in some of the latest studies, we're seeing that they're getting, they're diagnosing about 50%. And then the cost savings to the states is just huge. Yep. Yep. So it just helps everybody. It's a win-win all around. And I'm trying to convince them this time, rather than putting it into a composite bill to have it a standalone bill, I think it'll go straight through. So um, that's one of the things. And it, it's something that we as a council can can support. But I just wanted you all to know that I'm already actively pursuing that. If there's other issues that you want to actively pursue, please, you know, throw it out there now or tell me, um, you know, tell Michelle, tell myself um, until we get other officers. <laughs> yeah. uh, I have a, a preliminary question before I give my, my suggestion. Do you think that there is a fairly high use of ambulance services within the rare disease community? Oh, I don't know. Not not within the group that I take care of. Okay. One thing will say about, because I, I almost exclusively take care of rare disease patients. And I take care of a very a very broad swath of disorders. Um, our families and patients, either they're, they are either it's the parents who get really good really quick at doing this, or they're older patients who have been doing this most, if not all their lives tend to be good about knowing when they need to come in or knowing what they need to do and reaching out early okay. and clearly so come in via ambulance. They're either, they're either coming in via car before they completely crash or, or they're coming in um, family members or members are bringing them in. But my experiences are rare disease families tend to be so on top of stuff. I mean, it certainly happens. There certainly are crises, but I would say it's probably lower than the general population. Cause I think our, our patients, our families, cause they've been doing it for so long, um, whether they're individual patients, whether they're, you know, spouses or parents, just get really good at knowing what to do and how to navigate the system more effectively. Yeah, okay. I think you're right on that. Okay. Well, so my initial suggestion was you can, um, with the No Surprise Billing Act, it didn't cover ambulances. So um, your ambulance ride could be out of pocket, even if your insurance covers the hospital. But if it's not applicable enough to this group, that um, I, yeah. It it is applicable to the group, but it's not. Um, we're not a high use. That's I'm thinking. Our energy is best spent on more targeted issues that affect broader. Um, well, I think like population. the issue that Veronica brought up. We don't have enough, um, you know, know, nursing coverage for our population. That's one of the big problems, and I, I know that was a problem that I faced. Mary, I think you faced it as well, haven't you? And not just nursing, just um, you know, care. personal care. Yeah, to come in, you know, as an also a single parent with now my kids are adults. It is it is a struggle, and I, I I don't know if we can work on communication like with DSS because a lot of the population is either getting services from DSS or DDS. Right, uh, there's a huge difference between the two state agencies. So I, maybe that is something that can be worked on. And that's that's something we can talk to you about, like we talk to the two stage agencies about um, just becoming more aware. I think a lot of people aren't aware of how complex our patient population is. Mm -hmm. or, that's, our that's definitely a problem. And because rare diseases are, as you said, so vast, yeah. um, I think sometimes the whole group is looked at as one population and it's just not the way it is. Maybe more, you know, if families could interact more with DSS staff and DDS staff. I know DSS doesn't even have a council, but DDS does. And yeah. I think things like that help, like just general awareness, lived experiences, and what people are really going through. I think there's a big disconnect. At least that's our experience. Um, 
You're not alone. I know. Yeah. <laughs> we live that with Kelly as well. And I know a lot of the families do. Yeah. So, I mean, maybe, you know, helping families learn and DSS learn like a, some better connection to help families get what they need. It's all, it seems to always be a terrible fight and it's always adversarial. So that could be a huge change for families. Yeah. And I think it's monetarily beneficial overall to uh, insurances and the government even, you know, they, there's not enough support for parents and for in-home services. I deal that with that with all my patients. Yeah. Agreed. I think this is part of, I think, the strategic planning process that we're kind of going into now. So I, I will get that SWAT out to us. So um, in the next couple of weeks, I actually looked, I have access to Qualtrics, which is um, for free, which is something I've done it on before. So I think when we get that, we can start putting on like, what are our priorities? What do we think uh, our strengths or weaknesses, things we need to address? And, and I think doing that will help. And then we can have those to present the composite of everybody's um, input for the January meeting. And then we can start building of these, you know, whatever we get, let's say 20, 20 things we need to work on. Like what can we lump together? Or what can we do? How do we tier it in, in, in working on something? And I think that will really help us start to get focused um, to what, how we're going to move forward. That, that if, unless someone has a better idea, that was, I think that would be the, a good starting point. No, it sounds like a good idea. We yeah, need to start on a yeah, strategic plan. So yeah. I will go that that Qualtrics out to everybody. She'll have time to work on it. Um, if not before the holidays, then then right after, because I know the holidays can get a little nuts for everybody, myself included. Yeah, Michelle, I think this makes a lot of sense. You know, if in January we have that kind of complete and we've got sort of our top shelf of, you know, at least from all of our lenses where there might be key areas that we want to kind of focus, then that can really get us ready for sort of that March timeframe where we have a face-to-face -face discussion. Maybe that's where we're really thinking about, okay, what really are the priorities? What, who's done in education and research, who's doing, you know, we can really then get, uh, you know, if we, if we work against that March sort of time frame where we're going to be face-to-face -to, -face to kind of build all the way up, have those priorities and then start to assign who's going to do what and then um, get into that next cadence. I think that's would be a great approach for us and it's, it seems like it should be completely achievable. Um, just because yeah. we, have, we have five minutes left, is there anything else to talk about? Uh, Leslie, is there anything else you want to talk about about the rough draft bylaws executive committee? No, um, like I said, I will reach out to everybody. Um, so expect an email from me at some point in the next few weeks. And I, I just kind of look for your ideas. If you just If you just want to look it over briefly, that's fine. If you want to make major changes, that's fine. There are grammatical errors and everything else. I know I was rushing just to get it out to everyone. Um, those can all be cleaned up. That's not a big uh, big deal. But if there's any language that you have a problem with, anything that's in there that you have a problem with, let me know and we'll try and refine it and then discuss it with everyone else. And if you're interested in being the secretary or treasurer, that would be, uh, I would love to hear from volunteers. <laughs> And then Leslie, there's something in the chat here that I just wanted to bring up here. Someone asked, are the proposed bylaws available for public review? Um, I don't know if they were posted. Uh, do you want to post the rough draft or do you want to wait until we get a little better draft? I, I, My personal feeling is we should get something that, that is close to our final product for public comment before when we're yeah. kind of just batting things around. I think it's going to it may muddy the waters. Uh, less yeah. people agree. So why don't we, um, we'll get uh, the bylaws up next month or yeah, January. As soon as they're cleaned up, cleaned up we have what we think is a good close to final product. We could put them up for, for public re public comment. Does, does that Probably work? In yeah, if we, if we shoot for like the first or second week in January, we might be able to do that. Yep. Does that sound agreeable to everybody? Yep, yep, that sounds really good. And I would say for people on the public, if you, um, I think most people have a connection to someone on this this committee, or if if not, I think there, I don't know there's a main website, but if you have things that you would like us to consider, please feel free. I, I know some people on the committee. I think everybody knows Leslie on the committee and that, that's here. So please feel free to well, share. I've been in touch with all of you for support for all yeah. of the, the law yeah, and everything. Absolutely. Exactly. I, I, my email is on my fate on my page, my Yale page, my Yale uh, homebook page, my our emails there. So please feel free. You have, have comments, um, 
least for me, I do better if you do them in bullet points rather than paragraphs. That would be amazing just because I get between 100 and 200 emails a day, just my regular work job. Uh, but but whatever you would like to send, I'm happy to review as I think anybody else would be as well. So we can um, get as many things in here. And I will, I will, we could put those as part of, you know, uh, things when we go to review stuff again in January. Okay. okay. Um, summarize, so summarizing the meeting here, I think Leslie, you already did that for, um, for most of it. So Leslie's going to work on the bylaws and getting people, people to volunteer for the executive committee. Um, <laughs> We discussed that the meeting format is we are going to do virtual uh, December, just, just as a reminder, because of the holidays, December meeting has been canceled. We'll meet again in January. January and February will be virtual meetings. We will be in person in March with a, I will give you a, a solid place where that's happening very soon. Um, Rare Disease Day is preliminarily set for February 29th. Leslie will come back with additional um, information. information on on logistics of that. Leslie, did I miss anything in summarization? I don't think so. And if anybody wants to speak at Rare Disease Day, please let me know. Or if you'd like to be the MC for it, that's fine too. Um, we can work all that out. Uh, I think right now we probably need a motion for closing. Can we have a motion to close? So I'm going to send a motion to close the meeting. Do we have a first? Oh, first. Second. The meeting is closed. You guys, everybody have a wonderful month of December. Um, and I, I hope you have a time celebrating uh, whatever holidays you celebrate or just relaxing time with your family and friends and loved ones. Stay healthy, stay well, and we'll see you back in January. Thanks for sharing. Thank you.